it walks through all the basic skills of pitching and recruiting and selling and product development and you know, all the good stuff you need to know. You are listening to EducationHackers.com, podcasting from Vancouver, Canada. Education Hackers highlights successful entrepreneurs with great online courses. And now to introduce today's guest is e-learning evangelist Steve Atwall. Today, I'm very honored to have Guy Kawasaki on the show. Guy is the chief evangelist of Canva, an online graphic design tool. Formerly, he was an advisor to the Motorola business unit of Google and chief evangelist of Apple. He is also the author of The Art of Social Media, The Art of the Start, Ape, Author, Publisher, Entrepreneur, Enchantment, and nine other books. Guy has a BA from Stanford University and an MBA from UCLA, as well as an honorary doctorate from Babson College. Guy, I'm really glad to have you on the show. Before we dive into the interview, why not tell our listeners where you are right now? <laughs> um, right now, I'm in the Opryland Hotel in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, when I think of Nashville, I think of country music and Johnny Cash. Are you a country music lover? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for the National Religious Broadcasters meeting, talking to them about social media. Right. So that's the NRB 2015 International Christian Media Convention. Yep. That's the award-winning exposition with resource to help expand and enhance your media efforts, whether you're a broadcaster, media pastor, Program producer, webmaster, social media manager, blogger, <laughs> podcaster, <laughs> or other communications professional. So uh, there must be a lot of people there then. Well, so far I've been in the hotel five minutes, so I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I literally have no idea. So you haven't actually been to it yet? No, no, I just walked in. Wow. So when do you present? I present tomorrow morning. All right. So when I told my girlfriend I was going to be talking to the chief evangelist for Canva, she didn't yeah. know what that meant. What does it yeah. mean to be an evangelist for a company? Do you have uh, to use the word hallelujah a lot? No, no. Uh, what it means is that you are spreading the good news of the company's product or service. So I was uh, an evangelist for Apple, for Macintosh, the good news of Macintosh. And now I'm an evangelist for Canva, the good news about Canva. Uh, Canva democratizes design just like Apple democratized computing. And so uh, that's that's what I do. I democratize stuff. Awesome. So before we get into your online course, I always like to ask my guests, how do you like to relax when you're not working? How do you unwind? Do you have any hobbies? Yeah, I love to play hockey. So I play hockey. And I, I even... I even arranged to play hockey here in Nashville. So uh, that's my passion. I love to play hockey. Everybody has to have a, a vice. That's my vice. For sure. Is that like outdoor hockey, indoor ice hockey? Indoor ice hockey, yeah. Awesome. That Well, that's the number one sport for Canada. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Hawaiian stuck in a – excuse me. I'm a Canadian stuck in a Hawaiian body. <laughs> So do you watch all the hockey games and NHL? Oh, yeah. Uh, but mostly I watch the Sharks. All right. Did you grow up in Hawaii? You were born in Hawaii. Did you actually grow up in Hawaii? Yes, yes. Born and raised. So I guess you are you must have watched Hawaii Five O. 0 uh, Yeah, I did. I watched it then and I watch it now. <laughs> you know, that was my number one show growing up in the UK. Seriously? Steve McGarrett. Um <laughs> Yeah. Chin Ho. He was the debonair guy that was that always looked good. It didn't matter what he did, where he was, he always looked good. Oh, man. He always had a suit on. You know? And this was in the UK? Well, yeah. I mean, I grew up in the UK. Yeah. So I was there until 1980. And Hawaii 5.0, it, it would come on once a week. And everybody would be just crowded around the... The old tube TV and uh, just watching Steve McGarrett and Hawaii Five O. It was a big, big show. Oh my God, that is hilarious! That is <laughs> hilarious. Huh. I hope you learned something. Oh yeah, well we <laughs> learned how to dress properly. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, I went to a sort of a semi-private school, 
yeah. for boys, and we all yeah. always had to wear a uniform. Oh, really? The suit and tie, all boys school. Yeah. Yeah, and caning was very popular there. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's that's a funny that's a funny connection. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, yeah. We always loved the Hawaii Five O. Let's talk about your online course, "The Essential Guide to Entrepreneurship" by Ka- Guy Kawasaki. Give us a bird's eye view of the course. What do you cover? Who is it for? And why should people be signing up for it? Well, the bird's eye view is that it is a video adaptation of a book that I have called "The Art of the Start." And the Art of the Start is, you know. May I modestly or immodestly say kind of the de facto standard for entrepreneurs to read. And so, you know, some entrepreneurs want to read, some entrepreneurs want to watch. And so Udemy contacted me to do a book. Uh, and it, it walks through all the basic skills of pitching and recruiting and selling and product development and you know, all the good stuff you need to know. And it's in video format, short little chapters, uh, a few hours in total. But, uh, you know, it's, it's meant to bring people up to speed in entrepreneurship as quickly and as easily as possible. So who's the target audience for this? Anybody with 29 bucks <laughs> <laughs> or, or 49 or 199 You know, there's a lot of different pricing on this. Uh, maybe we should erase that part. So uh, Actually, I think you can get it for $10 right now with the Udemy uh, special. I, I really don't know. <laughs> I mean, this is an experiment in pricing. I have no idea. Well, you, you know, if you if you join the Udemy promotions, they yeah. have these ten dollars specials. So they put all the courses on, almost all the courses oh, on yeah. for ten dollars. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a lesson there too that you have to pay attention to to save money in the world. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you need a passion for entrepreneurship and a willingness to start to take this course. Or or twenty nine bucks, yeah. <laughs> Uh, either one will do both are preferable yes <laughs> yeah because a lot of people they, they sign up for a course and they don't end up actually taking it is that right is that true well yeah there's there are so many free courses online we talk about uh, MOOCs yeah. massive open online courses by MIT and all these universities they're, they're all yeah. free yeah and then you sign up and then unless you're kind of motivated or you know have that desire you may not end up taking it. That's interesting. I mean, you know, that that is an indication of itself, right? That uh, well, you could interpret that two ways. One is if you're an entrepreneur, you don't have time to learn. You're just going to do, which you, know, you can view that positively. Um, another way of looking at it is if you don't have the discipline to watch a few hours of video to make your company better then, you know, how are you possibly going to survive as an entrepreneur? Because you can't even, you know, you can't even discipline yourself to do that. Um, you're pathetic. So it depends on how you want to look at it. Exactly, exactly. So, so true. <laughs> <laughs> the course includes 55 lectures and four hours of content. And an overview of the key aspects of entrepreneurship, the most do's and don'ts of an entrepreneur, um, you have anecdotal advice based on real world examples. The course is not for people who are not looking to be decision makers in the company. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, hmm, that doesn't <laughs> sound right. <laughs> yeah, there's, there are too many knots in that uh, description. Yeah, double negative. Yeah. yeah. The course is for people who want to be decision makers in their company. There you go. There you go. We should change that description on Udemy. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, tell us, uh, you know, there are four, actually, there's two, four, six, seven, about six main sections or modules yep. to the course. And uh, you, you cover launching, pitching, fundraising, building a team, social media, evangelizing. So in terms of launching, you have an exercise called What is Your Mantra? Mm-hmm. So what's your mantra, Guy? My personal mantra is to empower people. So with two words, I describe why I exist. And that's the point. The point is, in a very short way, can you describe why you exist? Because, you know, you you can't take a minute or two to explain that. Um, People don't have that kind of attention span. You need to be able to explain this in 
two or three words. And then it also makes it easier for all your employees to remember, you know, why you exist. Uh, as opposed to mission statements, which are, you know, 50 or 60 words long. And, you know, who, who can remember the mission statement of most companies? Um, nobody, actually. <laughs> not, not even the CEO, especially the CEO, probably. Well, in terms of employees, I think they're thinking, well, this person exists, so they can pay my paycheck. Yeah, well, I hope not. I mean, that that's probably not your ideal employee, you know what I'm saying? No, no. But <laughs> as a leader, as, as somebody who's leading the company, you have a mantra, you, you have a passion, you have a desire to make this company successful. So you have to have that mantra that you, you, you live by. So what are some of the common mistakes uh, entrepreneurs make? I, I think the one of the most common mistakes is that they they try to multiply a small number like 1% of a very large market. So they think, you know, how hard could it be if I just get 1% of a 100 billion dollar market, I'll make a billion dollars. Well, you know, it's not so easy to get 1% of a 100 billion dollar market and probably a lot of the market is truly not available to you. So, you know, if, if you're a software company and you say, well, the, if you're a security company and you say, well, the security market is $100 billion, well, you know, $20 billion of that is hardware, $20 billion of that is, I don't know, enterprise software, $20 billion of that is long-term consulting fees. You know, after you separate all the stuff, you know, how much do people spend on personal security software probably is not $100 billion. And I think people make that mistake all the time. They take a small percentage of a big number and think, oh, it can't be that hard. It is hard. Everything's hard. Yeah, everything worth doing is hard. Yeah. Something's not, something's not worth doing are hard, too. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to be a bit of a storyteller, don't you? Yes, because telling stories is the best way to separate yourself from everybody else who's saying they have a great product, great service, you know, scalable, patent pending, curve jumping, all the BS that everybody uses. So I think a story personalizes why you did something. You know, it, it's a hook, really. Yeah, so you have to tell your story. Why Why you're launching? What, what's your purpose? And why did you get to that point? So you talk about adoption versus scaling. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yes. So uh, I, I think that many people are putting the proverbial horse before the cart. And they're worried about, you know, well, how can my company scale when I have millions of customers and we're doing, you know, thousands of transactions per second? And meanwhile, you know, they don't even have a prototype. They're two people in a garage. They have zero customers, right? And so my recommendation is that, first of all, you know, wake up. <laughs> Because that's not, you know, you should be so lucky that your worst problem is you cannot scale. Um, I haven't seen that happen as the reason why companies die very often, let's just say. So what you need to understand is that when you are small, when you are young, you need to do things that you cannot do when you're larger. Uh, this would be hand-holding customers. This would be, you know, creating custom solutions for customers. It, who knows what it is, but... When you are a small, young company, you have to do what you have to do. And uh, then you hope that you do what you have to do. And it leads to larger and larger so that you have the funds and the experience and the personnel to scale. But to, to worry about scaling initially, um, it, that leads to all sorts of perversions. So you have to have adoption first before you can think of scaling. Yeah, yeah, like I said, I've never seen a company uh, fail because it couldn't scale fast enough. I mean, that's just, I can't think of an example, but I've seen many companies who scaled in advance of their sure winner. You know, they built up customer service in infrastructure and um, hosting and, you know, all this kind of stuff because they knew that A, their software would be on time and B, that the dogs, the customers would really eat it. And neither of those were true. Well, I'm thinking of Target in Canada. Yeah, what yeah. happened? Well, <laughs> they opened up all these stores across Canada, and now they're closing them. They're closing them all because I, I think they didn't follow your advice. They didn't have the <laughs> adoption. You know, they opened too many stores too quickly and realized that, you know, this isn't working. So now they're closing them all. 
How, how many did they open? Oh, Hundreds? I can't remember, uh, but they took over basically all the Zeller stores, and there were quite a few Zeller stores yeah. across Canada. And they just kept opening these stores. And I think within a year, um, they had, they were across Canada. And then they realized, oh, okay, this isn't quite working. There, there was nothing unique <laughs> about them. I mean, there, people were thinking about them as Walmart. You know, there was nothing yeah. to distinguish them between, yeah. between them and Walmart. It wasn't the pricing. It wasn't uh, anything in particular that was distinguishing Target from Walmart. And did they think they were just going to walk into Canada and, you know, everybody's going to roll over for them? I guess that's what they assumed because Canadians like to go across the border and they like to shop at Target uh -huh. across the border. Uh huh. But I think there's a different, a different, um, different kind of mentality when people <laughs> go across the border. Well, for one thing, there's a fundamental difference about sales tax, right? Exactly. So that, that's kind of a difference, you know, minor <laughs> detail, right? Yeah, yeah. Huh. Huh. So, yeah, they, they opened up all these stores and now they're closing them. You should have come up with this course about a year ago and they should have taken it and then, you know. I don't think anybody from Walmart will be taking this course. <laughs> uh, I don't want to. I don't want to burst your bubble. Okay. No, I was but, thinking of Target. You know, Target. Well, Tommy Target. Target. <laughs> I don't think anybody from Target's gonna read this. Yeah. <laughs> just, just I'm just guessing at that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> so yeah, then you have another module called pitching. Yes. Now pitching is where you go to pitch for your business and try to get some maybe some funds. What does your startup do? You know, you try to figure out why and how the pitch and create a pitch for your business. You videotape yourself. You know, you think about things that can go wrong. You get some feedback. Yeah. So what's your advice on pitching? Well, first of all, uh, people need to understand that if you're an entrepreneur, basically, if you're breathing, you're pitching. You're, you're always trying to get something, right? And... Uh, that's a, that right there is an important concept that as an entrepreneur, you're always selling. I mean, that's just, you know, sometimes you sell for capital. Sometimes you sell to recruit. Sometimes you sell for resources. You know, whatever it is, you are always selling. You need to, you know, wrap your mind around that that's how your life is going to be. It's a very important skill. I mean, arguably they're, you know, are kind of only two necessary skills in a startup. Somebody's got to make it and somebody's got to sell it. And so this comes down to the person who's selling it. And when all the dust settles, that's all you really need in a startup. Everything else is fluff. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so what are the, some of the things that you've seen that should be avoided in a pitch? Uh, mostly, the, the I think the most common mistake is people tend to take off too slowly that, you know, they take off like a 747 and what they should take off is like an F-18 taking off an aircraft carrier. And so they think that, you know, somehow they need to warm up the audience and start slow and, you know, handhold them. But in fact, uh, most people listening to a pitch probably are ADD and so they need to, you know, get from zero to liftoff in two seconds. Um, it, it's not about, you know, let me tell you my whole life story. Let's be friends. You know, this is how I, this is how my family got to America. I mean, nobody cares. Just, just take off, man. Think of that steam powered catapult on top of an aircraft carrier and it's going to just blast you off. That's what you should be thinking. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah. I think a lot of companies and a lot of small businesses just don't, maybe it's kind of a lack of, lack of self-confidence, not realizing their own worth and their own value. You know, I, I honestly, I don't think that's the problem. I, I think they're just poor presenters that they haven't been trained that, um, you know, you need to get off to a fast start. They just think that I don't know. Maybe they remember their grade school where, um, you know, everybody participated and everybody got to speak and, you know, everybody got positive reinforcement because you, you know, you didn't, surely you didn't want to psychologically ruin these kids. Uh, but you know, that's not what we're talking about in the real world at this point. So do you have a template for, um, a pitch? Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. 
uh, we have a template, and not only do we have a template, um, uh, Udemy brought in this team and they pitched me, and I basically shredded them. So uh, Udemy wanted to see what you know real life feedback is like. <laughs> right. <laughs> And believe me, they did find out. So um, that is one of the more entertaining parts of the course. <laughs> All right. That's in Section 3, pitching. All right. <laughs> so Section 4 is about fundraising. You talk about types of funding. When, when, do you, when do you feel that you should be thinking about funding? Well, in a sense, you always have to be thinking about funding uh, because, you know, unless you're independently wealthy um, and mom or dad is going to write a check, then you have to consider this. But having said that, you know, the goal of a company is not to get funded. The goal of a company is to create customers and products. Luckily, we're at a, uh, a strange and good time where it's much cheaper to start a company. Because everything that you need is kind of fast or free these days, um, or fast and free. Like social media is free marketing, and uh, hosting your site and stuff in the cloud is free. Infra- it's not free infrastructure, but it's much cheaper infrastructure, and tools are free. I mean, you know, you go down the list, everything is much, much cheaper. So that's just very fortunate for everybody. Yeah, for sure. Um, I use Google Docs a lot, and that's totally uh-huh. free. Uh-huh. So you don't even need Microsoft Office. You can just do everything in the cloud. Yeah, All right. you could. I don't do that, but you could, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of funding, give us some, some types of funding. You know, the base, there's several. So one is crowdfunding, which is basically pre-sales, uh, no equity dilution. Uh, you go on Kickstarter or Indiegogo and do this. Uh, another is friends, fools, and family. We call this the three Fs. And uh, these are people that, you know, are investing in you because they're related to you, they like you, you know, whatever. Uh, there's angel investing who are, you know, retired or semi-retired rich people who want to help the next entrepreneur, who want to dabble in uh, investment. And then there's, you know, classic venture capital, which is really appropriate for just a few thousand companies a year. And any tips for finding these investors? Uh, one major tip is if your product is good enough, they're going to find you. So, uh, you know, focus again on the good product. But it, it, it's a matter of going to the right kind of events and a very good introduction is from your corporate finance attorney who can call up a venture capitalist and say, you know, I just incorporated these two people and they have an excellent idea. Another good connection is a university professor, you know, saying that, well, these are the best computer science students I've ever had in my career. Um, another would be if you know a executive, an executive of an existing company in that venture capitalist portfolio. So, you know, let's say you know the CEO of a company in somebody's, some venture capitalist portfolio, and you have that guy or gal call up the venture capitalist and say, listen, my buddy just started a company. It's a very interesting company. You should take a look at it. That will work all the time, too. Yeah, for sure. you got to be out there, and you got to be visible. So in terms of the material, you have some supplementary material for that. Does that include, you know, trying to find these investors and maybe some templates, email templates to send out? I did not put an email template in there. I can, you know, I can give you the gist of the best email. The best email, first of all, is someone writing for you, i.e., the professor, the lawyer, the CEO in the portfolio. Now, assuming that, you know, we can't get that. Then uh, brevity is everything. Um, you basically need to explain what you do in the in the first paragraph, and um, you know talk about your underlying magic, and then ask for a meeting. The most important part is probably the subject line because if your subject line sucks, you know no one's going <laughs> to read your your the rest of the email. So it's all about brevity. I mean, basically, it is a pitch. It's a written pitch in the form of an email and less is more maybe people you know think they send a really long email they're going to bludgeon someone into being interested and that is just simply not true i would say the longer the email the less likely it is to succeed so is it kind of a limit maybe two two three four paragraphs uh, i say i say five paragraphs is the most you could ever do and shorter paragraphs 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not like War and Peace <laughs> paragraphs. Yeah. Right. So yeah, so you have to have a brevity, and you have to convey yes. your information in a very concise way. Well, let's just say that I have never encountered an email that was too short. Because people seem to have less and less attention span now. Well, yeah, I mean that, and but that's kind of putting the blame and saying you know we all have psychological issues. That's that's not my point. Um, my point is, you know, you are selling, you are not buying. And when you are selling, the, the, the onus, the burden is upon you to do what the buyer wants. It's not upon the buyer to, you know, uh, adjust his or her perspective to yours. Just like who needs who more? Yeah, for sure. It's, it just seems that everybody, not just us, but the, the investors are probably being inundated by all these pitches. And they want to see clarity and uh, conciseness and decide based on that. Yep. Well, you know, and, and you know, just to be uh, specific here, they don't decide based on an email that they're going to invest. Mm -hmm. Okay. They, 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 the purpose of an email is to get to a meeting. There's no email in the world that will convince someone to write a check. Unless you're Steve Jobs, okay? If you're Steve Jobs <laughs> and you send an email to, to you know, any venture capitalist and say, I'm Steve Jobs, you've heard of me, and I, I need to raise $50 million, um, that would work. But let's just say that most people taking this course are not Steve Jobs, okay? So it, it, it takes a long, it's probably a six-month process, starting with an email uh, and then a meeting then a meeting with the partners, and then a follow-up meeting, and then due diligence, and then thrashing around on terms. And, you know, when, when all is settled, it's probably taking six months. Now, you hear stories of things that were, were funded in a day and all that, right? But let me say, I mean, that's the rare exception, and that's why those things are news. It's not because that's how it always happened. Do you get into that uh, in your course? I mean, all the steps that you have to go through in terms of, not it's just not just an email you have to actually get them interested first and then have a meeting and then follow up and so on. Do you, do you go into that as well in your course? Not so much. I, I definitely don't lay it out the way I just laid it out for you. I, mean, I could not, I can't cover everything in that course. <laughs> it's sort of, uh, it sort of makes sense though. I mean, it, it makes sense that, you know, you wouldn't just send an email and somebody would be funding your company just based on an email. But well, you'd be surprised at how many people think that's that's the way it happens. <laughs> They're hallucinating. Yeah, because you, you're somebody in the cloud. No, they don't know you. Yeah, they have to get to know you. Well, I, I mean, you know, a very simple test is ask yourself if you receive the email. Is there is it is it conceivable that you would get an email over the transom which would make you write a check? Because you'd have to be pretty stupid yeah. to do that. <laughs> I mean, there's the crowdfunding where. People don't really know you, but they, you know, they're going through a third party. Right. And they're only, you know, they're only risking 75 or 100 bucks, right? It's not, it's not like a venture capitalist who's putting millions at play. Right. Exactly. So then you get into building a team. When, when do you think about building a team? Uh, it's kind of like asking me, when do you think of financing? Um, always <laughs> from, from the very start. Yeah, unless you're, you know, a total egotist that you figure that you can not only make it, you can also sell it. But, you know, let's just say there's not too many people like that. So, you know, Steve Jobs had Steve Wozniak, right? So if Steve Jobs couldn't do it, you know, odds are you can't. No, no. It's, I guess it depends on what it is that your company is doing and what it's producing. Because who you have as a team could be technical people, it could be marketing people, it could be... Yep. It could be writers, it could be publishers, it could be all kinds of people. Yeah, absolutely. And you need them all at some level, you know, eventually. Well, if you don't need them all, it means you're not growing, so. I mean, right now I'm thinking, you know, this podcast is kind of growing. I just had a huge spike <laughs> yesterday of a thousand plays yeah. and downloads. Yeah. And, uh. Yeah. In, in one day, yeah. a thousand people yeah. downloaded? Wow. That I don't happened, know. I just know? took a spike and I thought, oh, wow, this is, this is exciting. 
Maybe they heard you're talking to me. Well, I, I released a new no, episode. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I think there'll be even more like a huge, huge spike when I tell people I interviewed you. Well, yeah. we'll see. But uh, yeah, so I'm thinking, you know, my biggest pain point right now is editing these episodes. And I need somebody to edit them because it takes five, six hours to edit each episode. Oh, uh, man, I hear you. You know, I, I once wrote a book that was a collection of interviews. And I thought, oh, it's going to be so easy. You just turn on a tape recorder and then you give it to a transcriber. And, you know, a few days later, you get this perfect transcription and boom, you're done. And man, that is like so untrue. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not even close to true. It's, it's harder, I think, to make a transcription into a good interview than it is to write it yourself. Well, if you it's, think about it, wow. uh, the person that's doing the editing or transcribing doesn't really have your voice. And they're not looking at yeah. it from your perspective because you might say, oh, we've got to cut this out. We've got to add this. They don't know that. Mm -hmm. All they're doing is a literal yeah. translation. Yeah. I found an even bigger problem when you're doing something like this is uh, for editing is that, you know, honestly, myself included, most people are not that articulate. Mm -hmm. It's a rare person that you interview who's so articulate that you don't have to throw much of what he or she said away. I truly do believe that. And so it's not, it's not that the transcriber, um, is at fault and has poor judgment or, you know, whatever. It's that, you know, you, if you give, um, the transcriber a sack of crap, you're going to get a sack <laughs> of crap back. I mean, <laughs> you know? There's no other way to say it. I've had a few guests that had, you know, they were repeating a word too many times. So yeah, they would repeat one mm -hmm. word over and over and over again. And it was, yeah, it took a lot of editing to take those <laughs> those out. <laughs> I bet it did. I bet it did. I, I can hear your pain. <laughs> so what do you look for in a team? What do you look for in a team? Basically... You know, the two main roles that someone can make it and someone can sell it. Cause that's, you know, I truly do believe that's about all there is <laughs> to it. But there has to be a good fit as well. Because if you have more than a few people on the team, they have to work well together. There has to be a good fit. Yes. But, uh, you know, there's not, there's no arguing against that, but it's so hard to determine fit because. Uh, not only fit within the team, but fit between you and the team. Because let's just say that that's the dating phase, right? And uh, the question is, what happens when you're married and things are falling apart? That's the question. And it's very hard to predict that. Oh, it is. I have lots of stories about dating, you know. But <laughs> yeah. So. The honeymoon uh, phase, they call it. And, um, you yeah. know, the first while is great. And then you start living together and it's not so great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, that and, and that's what it's like with a company within the company, and also between the company and its investors. That's how it is. So you can't you can't really predict that. It's a matter of you know getting the people that you think are good and that you want, checking references, and getting them to join, and then seeing how it works. Basically, I mean, it's a crapshoot. That's just. You know, the way it is, but I, I will say that uh, my theory, contrary to what many people may believe, is that sales fixes everything. So, um, you'd be surprised how well a team gets along that's making their numbers, you know? And, and so the question is, did the team make their numbers because they get along? Or do they get along because they make their numbers? Hmm. And, that is, you know, you may think that's a facetious question. That is a dead serious question. You, know, you could make the case that if you start a company and things just start booming and taking off, everybody's going to get along. And it's not because necessarily they're all great and they're all wonderful and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's because, you know, the rising tide floats all boats. Yeah, I often think that, uh, I don't know if you watch Star Trek and The Next Generation with Captain Picard. Yeah. Every time I watch that show, all the people yeah. that were on that show, whether it was the engineer or the second in command or, or whatever, yeah, they were yeah. so professional that, you know, they didn't really let their emotions get in the way. 
of doing what they needed <laughs> to do. And because we're human and because we have emotions, I think a lot of times maybe that might get in the way or ego, whether it's emotion or ego, something might conflict. But you can't really predict that until yeah. people actually start working together. Well, it's kind of predictable. I mean, it's going to happen. It happens to everybody. But it always happens when things are going badly. And, you know, the rising tide not only floats the boat, the rising tide conceals incompetence. Mm. Now, wrap, wrap your mind around yeah, that. You have to for think a while. about that one for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so you also get into social media. Uh, you talk about planning your social media strategy, deciding which platforms to use, uh, creating your company profile page, getting followers. Yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. Actually, this is something that a lot of people can do really well or can kind of mismanage because we heard about Twitter bombing recently where, um, you know, Twitter bombing is, you know, basically tweeting too many times over and over again and having direct links to videos and audios and, you know, sort of faking numbers, basically. And you're not really getting the right people or you're not getting engagement. Yeah, we could spend a whole hour on this topic. But, you know, basically, I believe that social media equals marketing for most startups because you're not going to advertise on the Super Bowl, right? So, you know, thank you, God, that social media exists. And social media is all about content marketing. It's about earning the privilege by adding value to people's lives. So if you add enough value to people's lives, you can earn the right to promote. So this means you have to promote good content that is valuable, not that is, you know, there's a difference between what you want to say and what your customers want to hear. And what you need to do is put out stuff they want to hear so that every once in a while you can say what you want to say. And that is a huge difference. And I, I think many, many companies don't get that. They think that, you know, somehow um, social media was created so that they can promote themselves constantly and, they're in a, for a rude awakening. There are so many different social platforms right now. There's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's Google+, Plus, there's LinkedIn. There's, there's so many different platforms. Do you have any preferences? I love them all. <laughs> Do you use them all? <laughs> I use them all. I mean, between me and my team, yeah, we use them all. I mean, that's just, that's what it takes to be me. It's not that easy being me, you know? People think it's easy. It's not. It's, it takes a lot of work. No, because you're everywhere. <laughs> Do you use SlideShare as well? I, I use SlideShare as well. Yeah, SlideShare integrated with LinkedIn is very good. Yeah, because with SlideShare, you can post to groups as well. Yeah, SlideShare is a beautiful thing. So getting your first followers, do you have any tips on that for people that don't have any, like they're just starting out in social media? They should start out by being value-added commenters that they... You know, look at posts from from interesting people, and they comment. They add value to the to the posts by commenting, and and then they you know they start posting themselves. They are always trying to pass what I call the reshare test, which is posting something so good that the people who get it would then share it to their followers. Mm. So, you know, it can be done. I mean. Lots of people think that you have to be a Guy Kawasaki to get lots of followers, and it's not true. Uh, if you just add value, it can be done. Yeah, I, I see a lot of people are posting, and I've started posting images um, on um, different social media, and images seem to attract people as well. Yes, images are very important. It doubles the engagement. Yes, I've I've started using some tools for that, and you know the ultimate tool is Canva. Definitely, I use Canva for uh, creating headers and images and adding text to them. It's a great platform. Hallelujah, man! I, I'm the chief evangelist of <laughs> Canva. So, how would you describe Canva to people? So, Canva is an online graphics design service that enables people to create beautiful graphics, whether these are flyers, business cards, posters, infographics, social media, cover photos, avatars, whatever it is. And basically, you go to Canva. It's a free service. You can use our stock photos or you can upload your own photos. We have, a, we have literally thousands of designs done in advance for you. And uh, then you... 
you save it, uh, you save it to a file or a PDF, and you use it. You know, you, I mean, you're a user, you know, it's very empowering, right? I mean, it, it enables people with very little design experience to create very, very beautiful designs. It's that simple. Well, it is, and it's all web-based, so you don't need to download anything till you start using it. Mm -hmm. And it yep. integrates with Facebook. Uh, you can create something and upload straight to Facebook and uh, a few other social networks as well. So that's a great tool, yeah. So uh, you you get into evangelizing. So this is a big, <laughs> I guess, a, a big area for yourself is evangelizing. You know, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but mm -hmm. how would you introduce somebody that is an evangelist, but they want to be an evangelist? How oh, how would you introduce them to that? What, what would you, advice would you give to them? Well, the start of all evangelism is aligning yourself with a great product or service because I can tell you from first-hand experience, it is a lot easier to evangelize something great than to evangelize crap. So <laughs> step number one is find or create something great. Everything else is easy after that. And then, you know, you have to view what you have as good news, that it is going to improve people's lives. So the difference between evangelism and sales is that an evangelist has the other person's best interests at heart, where a salesperson is usually trying to make his or her quota. Because evangelism doesn't stop at the end of the day from 9 to 5. It's always there. You're, you're so passionate about it and you believe in it that you're evangelizing basically any time you get the chance to. Yep. I mean, if you, it's kind of like pitching. You know, if your lips are moving, you're pitching or evangelizing. Right. So how do you, how do you become a human brand? <sighs> well, first of all, I would dissuade people from wanting to become a human brand because it implies such a level of arrogance and egotism um, that, I don't know, it's like bound to warp you. And, and that's if you succeed. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you're a human brand. Guy Kawasaki is a brand. Yeah, you know, I, I understand that. There's, you know, you might think there's some hypocrisy there, but I, I never set off one day and said, okay, Guy, you're going to make yourself into a brand. You know, I mean, I worked at, I've worked in technology for 30 years. I worked for small companies, large companies. I've kicked some ass. I've been kicked. And then, you know, and through all of this, somehow this brand emerged. I wrote 13 books, but I wrote 13 books not because I wanted to position myself as a thought leader. I wrote 13 books because I thought I had information that I wanted to share with people. Big difference, okay? So one of the things that many people want to be a brand do is they say, oh, I'm going to write a book because if I write a book, I'll get legitimized and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you know what? I hate to tell you, but people do not walk into bookstores or go to Amazon thinking, how can I legitimize Guy Kawasaki? You know, they're looking for ways to learn how to be an entrepreneur, how to be better at social media, how to be a better evangelist. They, they're, not, they're not trying to legitimize the author. No, that's, that's, nobody spends money on a book to help the author. Okay. They do it for themselves. And so you have to put yourself in that mind frame. And when you start off with the goal of, I want to be a brand, you know, all of a sudden, I don't know, it's just a very slippery slope. So I say just, you know, find or create great products and services, market them well, service them well, and you'll be successful. And then, you know, one of the, consequences of this is you'll become a well-known person and perhaps a brand. And so, you know, is Elon Musk a brand? Yes. But is he a brand because he wrote a book about himself or because he positions himself? No, it's because he made a great car, right? So, you know, Lee Iacocca became a, grand, a brand. That's because he made two great cars, you know, Mustang and, you know, Chrysler. And so you go down the list, Steve Jobs never wrote an autobiography. Uh, I don't think Steve Jobs cared about branding himself. Steve Jobs cared about making Apple this absolute, total, kick-ass, killing machine company. And he succeeded. And one of the consequences of that is Steve Jobs became a brand. So I guess my whole point is, you know, focus on the customer, making a great company. And then if you become a brand, hallelujah. But, you know, I don't, it's like too insipid to want to just become a brand. All right. <laughs> Yeah, you become a brand by association, by building great products and uh, building a great company. You become a great brand because people 
bestow upon you that honor, which is different than saying, I'm going to become a great brand by my own efforts to become a great brand. Let's assume that I'm one of your students and I've just purchased your course. What would you recommend as my first step to getting the most out of your course? You could do it either two of two ways. One is sort of sequentially the way I laid it out. Or, you know, if, if, you're, if your intense problem at the moment is fundraising, look at the fundraising stuff. If it's marketing, do the marketing stuff. You can jump around. So, um, you know, there is not, there's nothing in there that is theoretical and impractical. I am a very hands-on kind of person. So what are the big questions you're, you're getting asked uh, for this course uh, from the students? The most common question I get is, I didn't hear about the discount until it was over. Can you <laughs> extend the deadline? I'm serious. Uh, I'm serious. That's the question. And I just said that to you to me. I don't even get involved in that. So, no, I mean, if I may say, this course is, you know, it's kind of complete. It's there. I mean, between that and the book, people would have it covered. I mean, this is like, you know, going to a chef and say, you know, what sucks at your restaurant? Well, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to make it so nothing sucks. Now, you created this course, like you didn't, you weren't involved on the technical side. So tell us how you actually created the course. Uh, basically, Udemy called me up one day and said, we, we really like your work and we would like to uh, create a course. Uh, do you have any ideas? And I said, well, my idea is entrepreneurship. And they said, fine. And then uh, a few weeks later, we scheduled a time where they brought their camera crew and I showed up and we spent all, one day, you know, making various shirt changes so that it didn't look like I did everything in a day. And we recorded the whole thing and they went away with their cameras and their lights. And a few weeks later, the course was there. That's it. That's all I did. I showed up and all I was was the talent, so to speak. But but did you did you plan ahead of time? Uh, did you outline everything? The book is an outline, right? So uh, we narrowed down which subjects in the book to do, and there was kind of a basic gist of every out of every um, segment. But you know, so much of this is in the book, and so much of this. It's in my daily life that I didn't have to prepare much for it because, in a sense, I've been preparing 30 years for it. So they basically pointed the camera at you and said, speak. You know, honestly, more or less, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Awesome. Because you have everything in your head. Well, I have, I have enough. I have four hours worth in my head anyway. <laughs> so looking back... Um, I mean, the biggest thing for you, I guess, was, you know, just showing up and, you know, having all that experience and just being able to speak. And you're used to that. You're used to presenting and speaking at, at big functions. So you had to be called and said, let's do it. And you just showed up and said, okay. But in a sense, it took 30 years to get to that point. Of course, of course. I mean, you wouldn't be able to speak for four hours and create a course if you didn't have that background and that experience. Yeah, trust me. So, Guy, take a few minutes and offer you a best, most practical advice to anyone thinking of creating their first online course or training. Well, not to be facetious or anything, but you know, the, the best advice I can give you is truly become knowledgeable about a topic and then give a course. So I, I am kind of a purist this way. I really think you should know your stuff, not you shouldn't, you shouldn't go to the Udemy site and say, okay, so what I see is an opportunity to fill this missing piece. So I'll go do that. Because that's not, that's not legitimate. That's not sincere. That's not who you are, right? I don't believe in, you know, becoming a supply side expert that, you know, what's in short supply, I'll become an expert. I think you should, if, listen, if I went to Udemy or Udemy came to me and said, you know, we have, Social media already covered. We have entrepreneurship covered. We have evangelism covered. I would not say to them, well, what don't you have covered? And I'll do that. I would say to them, well, you don't need me then. Simple as that. It, it has to be something that's within you and yes. not just something that you see a lack of. Yes. So, well, guy, we've come to the end of the show. That's good because I am freaking starving. <laughs> we have come to the end of the show. 
I would love to keep talking with you, and I know you have a ton of things that you can teach us all. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing such valuable insights and advice. It has been a real pleasure speaking with you. Where can people connect with you online? What's the best place? Uh, best place is, well, you pick. I mean, you know, facebook.com slash guy, Twitter, Guy Kawasaki, Google Plus, Guy Kawasaki, LinkedIn, Guy Kawasaki, SlideShare, Guy Kawasaki, Pinterest, Guy Kawasaki, Instagram, Guy Kawasaki. So do you check them all? I check them all. All check right. them all. Yeah, that's, you know. And uh, I don't know when this comes out, but on March 3rd, the version 2 of The Art of the Star will be available. And I hope people will um, listen to this podcast, see the Udemy course, and think, you know, well, let's, let's go in there full bolt and get the book too, because then you'll have everything. Thanks for listening to Education Hackers. Check out the show notes and click the Love It button at educationhackers.com to send us some iTunes love. Until next time.